started. Uh, my name is Joanna Erdman, and I'm the Acting Associate Director of the Health Law Institute. Um, so it's my pleasure to welcome you this afternoon to the Health Law and Policy Seminar Series. This is a series that brings speakers to the Shield School of Law to chat about contemporary issues in health law and policy, and you'll find a full list of our speakers on the HLI's uh, website. And the seminars are always held on Friday at this time and in this room. So this afternoon, our uh, seminar is co-sponsored by the Trudeau Foundation, and it's our pleasure to welcome Stephen Hoffman. Um, Stephen is an Associate Professor of Law and the Director of the Global Strategy Lab at the University of Ottawa. He's an international lawyer uh, who specializes in global health law, global governance, and uh, institutional design. And uh, I would really invite you to visit the lab's website. It's an absolutely incredible um, organization, and especially for students in the room, it's fascinating to see the work uh, that they do in the clinic. Um, so I invite you to read up. So today, Stephen is going to present, and you can see on the screen, on how the world can win the war on antimicrobial resistance, superbugs attack. Um, he'll present for approximately 40 minutes, uh, after which we'll open the floor for um, questions and inquiries. So, um, welcome. Oh, I got that. Thanks. Hmm. So first, uh, thank you uh, very much uh, to the Health Law Institute, uh, to Joanna for the kind uh, invitation, the uh, kind introduction, uh, Constance, um, and others who I've met uh, during my visit here. It's uh, Dalhousie uh, is known across the country for having the longest standing Health Law Institute, so it's, uh, it's quite an honor uh, to be here and making this presentation today. So in presenting, I was asked to uh, come up with a title that would maybe attract a bit of an audience, be dramatic. And uh, I think, I hope uh, we did that. Uh, so superbugs attack, how can we win the war against antimicrobial resistance? The, uh, the idea was that uh, this is a real challenge that we are not seeing enough action for. And so uh, there's a need for a lot more attention. We're starting to see some of that, but then attention isn't enough. We actually need some real action to make sure we can address this challenge. The challenge uh, in, my play, in my mind starts actually uh, not uh, in today, but a uh, long time ago. We, um, in hundreds of years ago, so this is a map of uh, the spread of the bubonic plague across Europe 700 years ago. You can see that we would measure the spread of infectious disease by uh, the basis of, of per year. So the different color represents a different year as it's spreading across Europe. Now, uh, and, and in a world where the spread of infectious disease moves like this on a year-to-year -year basis is very different than what we have today where literally in 24 hours we can get anywhere in the world and carry bacteria and viruses with us. So this would be a map of the flight patterns that we see globally, uh, along with uh, cases or outbreaks of infectious disease that happen along the way. And as a result, we get scary outbreaks. Um, the most recent one uh, that was officially declared a public health emergency of international concern was Ebola, uh, broke out in 2014. Uh, in West Africa. Uh, that's caused uh, quite a bit of attention given it was an outbreak of something that ha typically happened in one area of the world, a very poor area, Sub-Saharan Africa. And you can see in here that the cases were pretty localized and different outbreaks over the previous 40 years. Suddenly we have infectious disease spreading though. We live in an era hyper-globalization, hyper-travel. And so this really got the world's attention. It spread to many different countries. Uh, rich countries, uh, which uh, then made sure there was quite a bit of political attention. And the world went crazy. <laughs> and so infectious disease, we live in a different world where it spreads. Uh, it's very difficult to stop that spread. And we also know that when it comes to us, we care. And so we cared about Ebola. Today we're talking about Zika. Uh, and uh, on Monday, um, the WHO, the World Health Organization, is convening an emergency committee to determine whether this is the next public health emergency of international concern and whether we should be um, having um, any sort of travel restrictions or anything. So uh, this is something that happens commonly and uh, it's something we need to be watching out for in a more systematic way. And with Zika, this is just uh, from the, the Economist, uh, a map showing uh, where there are currently cases of Zika virus 
and then where um, it's expected, uh, the areas that could be at risk. So uh, we live in a country uh, where fortunately at the moment we're not really at risk given um, the, uh, the 80s uh, mosquito which carries the Zika virus uh, does not right now live in Canada nor in Chile, but uh, the rest of the Americas uh, is uh, at risk as well as uh, the many other countries in the world that have it, uh, that uh, particular mosquito. But today, so I'm not talking about uh, the classic pandemic in the sense of the ones that are really loud and that we that we are talked about a lot in the media and that uh, that spread really uh, quickly in easily visible ways. I'm talking about the silent pandemic of antimicrobial resistance, which uh, some people call uh, superbugs. And um, unfortunately, uh, the superbugs is not cute and cuddly like our superbugs bunny here. Uh, actually, uh, it's quite terrifying. And uh, the reason uh, it is so terrifying is that it's something that hap is happening uh, under the radar uh, for quite some time and will continue to happen. And the reason I say it'll continue to happen is because this is a natural phenomenon. This is really uh, bacteria and viruses uh, evolving in response to its external environment in the same way that humans have evolved uh, over time in light of its external environment. And so here's a, a I'm try, in terms of antimicrobial resistance 101, uh, the science of antimicrobial resistance. Uh, to simplify, one way that this happens, that uh, bacteria and viruses develop resistance to existing antibiotics and antivirals, is that they get, they naturally develop that resistance in one. So let's say there's trillions of bacteria in the world. By natural random chance, one of those bacteria well, many of those bacteria are going to develop some sort of resistance to a drug that currently would kill it. And for example, one way is drugs often will um, be effective in killing bacteria, uh, for example, uh, by, um, let's say, blocking um, or by getting through a protein channel. So where there's a cell, the drug would travel through a protein channel into the bacteria and then that bacteria would die. Now, what if the bacteria, by random chance, happen to have defective protein channels? So suddenly, an antibiotic can no longer get through. Now, in the absence of antibiotics, this would be a defect. This bacteria would not survive very well. It's defective. It has a defective protein channel. It means all sorts of good stuff also can't get in. But in the presence of antimicrobials, in, the, in this case, in the presence of antibiotics, ones that usually kill bacteria, we have a situation where actually the defect becomes their super strength. It's their superpower which then means that they outcompete other bacteria and they proliferate. So it's a natural process of antimicrobial resistance. It happens naturally. But our use of antimicrobials actually significantly speeds the development of this resistance and is what allows it to really proliferate and spread globally. And so here, just to show the visualization, you can see that here we have one bacteria that's uh, not resistant, one bacteria that by random chance, let's say, develops the resistance. And then in a world without antibiotics, mostly uh, the ones that win are the ones that do not have the resistance because they're not defective. But in the presence of antibiotics, so when we take antibiotics, let's say in a hospital setting or in the community, we kill the bacteria that are still susceptible, leaving the other bacteria that are resistant to be there to stay. And then as a result, uh, they then outcompete and they multiply um, and, and, and go forward. So it's, uh, this is a natural phenomenon which all of us um, uh, contribute to, which humans contribute to. And so just to highlight the extent to the problem, um, you'll see that uh, there's in a clinical setting, um, we often will rely on antibiotics in order to improve our health. Much of the health gains over the last 100 years have been because of antimicrobials, including antibiotics, antivirals, antifungals. Uh, so they have been enormously successful in allowing us to live longer and healthier lives. But we've, they've come to the point where often we use them when they're not actually helpful. So on the left, you'll see this figure, this infographic, which is showing that uh, for adults, this is, these are US statistics, which maybe would be similar than in Canada, adults who visit the doctor for a sore throat how many of those people get prescribed an antibiotic? So usually a sore throat, if it presents itself, a doctor probably won't know what it is. And so, but they do know statistically, 10% of people who present with a sore throat, it'll be a bacterial infection, whereby antibiotics could be helpful. 90% of the time, 
it's not. And so 90% of the time, would be the, when patients come, it would be inappropriate to prescribe an antibiotic. But how many, what percentage of times do people who present with a sore throat get prescribed an antibiotic? 60% of the time. Which means assuming that all the 10% of people who actually needed the antibiotic or would benefit from the antibiotic, that we, at the very least an additional 50% are getting it. Additional 50% of people are getting it when it's not needed. Or in other words, six times as many people leave the doctor's office with a sore throat with an antibiotic who don't need it than who do need it. So that's, that's a problem. And it's a problem because, and it's not, it's a global, but it's also a national problem because you see in the right figure that those countries that use more antibiotics are also those countries that have the presence of more resistant bacteria. So this figure specifically on the bottom is um, if you're the countries that are further to the right, like China, Spain, and France, the people there use more antibiotics on a per capita basis. Uh, and then up on the vertical axis is the percentage of pneumonia causing bacteria resistance that are resistant to antibiotics. So in China, over 50% of pneumonia causing bacteria are resistant to antibiotics. So don't get pneumonia in China. <laughs> but also don't get pneumonia in Spain, France, uh, or uh, in the United States. So it's a... Uh, it's, it, this is, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very scary uh, thing when, um, and the link is quite clear. And it's not just doctors' faults. So uh, this was a study uh, done, a survey done in the US, and uh, this looks at how sick patients are often actually insisting on getting an antibiotic for their sore throats and other things when they leave the doctor's office. So 55% uh, of doctors said that they were pressured in order to prescribe an antibiotic. So that statistic, getting pressure, that's, that's not good, but um, that's okay. I mean, pressure's okay if it's, if, it's, if it's not having a health implication. But uh, what is gonna have a health implication is that 45% of doctors in the United States admitted to prescribing an antibiotic for bacteria when, it was, when they knew it was, a vi or thought it was a viral infection. 45% of doctors admitted that they gave a treatment which, uh, which then breeds resistance when they knew the treatment was not going to help the patients in front of them. That's crazy. And what maybe contextualizes it and explains it is that 44% of doctors said that they prescribed an antibiotic to get the patient to leave the room. <laughs> so we're all part of this problem. It's not just humans. Uh, as much as uh, we can talk about humans and we would want to focus on humans uh, because uh, the transmission between, of resistant bacteria or viruses between humans would, be most easily, would most easily happen. But uh, there's also um, a process called zoonosis whereby we get uh, disease from animals as well as some of the bacteria that affect animals would also affect humans. And so this statistic, which is again for the US, the global statistic is 75%. <laughs> But uh, the fact that most, the vast majority of antibiotics are currently used for animals is quite, uh, is, is quite a thing. If, and in many cases, um, this use of antibiotics in animals is not because the animal is sick. If so, that, that's important, right? Animal welfare, uh, ethics, uh, if an animal is sick and we can make the animal better with an antibiotic, great, and we should give it, and a veterinarian should be involved. But really what the most, the greatest use of antimicrobials, specifically antibiotics in animals, is for the fact that it allows uh, farmers to keep animals in closer conditions, whereby they live closer together, which on one hand would facilitate the spread of disease, but if they then give lots of antibiotics in a prophylactic way, such that even healthy animals, if they give antibiotics just en masse, then the risk of transmitting disease among animals in close quarters is lessened but uh, the alternative would be just to give animals a bit more room. Uh, the other use is that there is a side effect to antibiotics, which is that when they're consumed, an unintended side effect is that they bulk up. So actually giving antibiotics to animals currently is cheaper than giving animals more food. And so in some cases, um, antibiotics are specifically marketed and used in order to save on food costs. Yeah. Another interesting application of antibiotics is the use in products. Uh, we often don't think about this, but um, this is uh, a material health and safety data sheet 
for the use of an antibiotic paint for ship hulls. Now Halifax is a port and I know that ships are built here so um, one use uh, of these uh, things might be to actually paint a ship and maybe uh, in the hull and to make sure that mold doesn't, uh, doesn't develop. So that actually that sounds like that's a good use but, there's, but maybe not and I, it's, uh, it's, it is a use and we have to think about whether it's a high value use. I think what's clear though, a good example, my favorite example of what's crazy about this is um, when we use antibiotics in order to promote unhealthy practices. So this is a list of those antibiotics that are registered for use in plant agriculture in the United States. So it's a long list of lovely products, which I enjoy, and then it gets to the bottom where there's a product I don't enjoy, and which uh, is tobacco. I know it's small, apologies, but it's, uh, it's in yellow there. Tobacco, which uh, there's a disease wildfire, and streptomycin uh, can often can help reduce the presence of wildfire in tobacco. And as a result, tobacco plants get sprayed with streptomycin. The same drug that helps keep us healthy when we get sick is what is helping keep tobacco plants more vibrant so that they can be sold to more people who could then get cancer from it. So uh, at the very least, we can probably all agree that this is a low value use of our streptomycin, of our antibiotics, which then in turn breeds resistance and makes it so that the next time when we get sick, and we need streptomycin or another antibiotic, it's not as effective for us. So that's, this is bad. In terms of the statistics, um, a lot of people are already dying from antimicrobial resistance. So 700,000 people are currently estimated to die worldwide because of superbugs. But uh, it's not just 700,000 um, that we need to worry about. In the future, th this problem is exponentially uh, growing. Uh, given increased uh, use of um, airplanes and given the increase um, uh, in use of antibiotics around the world, uh, as well as the fact that we haven't been successful in developing new antibiotics, which would then be, come and replace the old ones that no longer work. And so by 2050, there's the expectation that 10 million people per year will die because of antimicrobial resistance. And just to note what you'll see there on the right-hand side in the graphic, on the, on the left is uh, the deaths from antibiotic resistance that are expected in 2050, so 10 million, that exceeds the expected death toll from cancer. It also exceeds the expected death toll from heart disease and from stroke. So basically, uh, antimicrobial resistance will be one of the most defining health challenges we face over the next 100 years. And if we don't take action in most of our lifetimes, we were going to see a lot of people die from this. And the challenge is that often when we see people die, it's, we don't often label it as antimicrobial resistance. There's a bit of a PR problem with this uh, challenge. When, we have, when someone dies um, from, a, from an infection, we call it, it's an infection. We blame that. We don't usually say it was resistant to the drugs that we tried to make it, um, the, for which we tried to address it with. So uh, there's a bit of a, there's no disease phase. People, um, this is actually a problem across public health. When people, uh, there's, like, there's a foundation for most diseases, a breast cancer foundation, heart and stroke foundation, the, there's their um, Alzheimer's and so there's, there's, when people ha get something, there's a foundation, there's a lobby um, that's encouraging action, which is great. Unfortunately, there's no face for this problem and people don't usually know when they actually die from it. So it's, uh, there's a PR problem um, that needs to be addressed. Unfortunately for us, and unfortunately uh, for the world, um, we can't address this problem within our own countries. We in Canada could do a lot to address antimicrobial resistance. We could do a lot more. We're not doing enough. But even if we spent every health dollar that we spend, if we spent it on addressing this challenge, we still wouldn't be able to solve it because all it takes is for one flight of one person flying carrying with them a resistant bacteria or a resistant virus, and then it comes to Canada, and then it can spread. So we need to do more, we should be doing more, but this is not a problem that can be fully addressed by individual countries acting alone. We, it needs, it's a global challenge. And so this is one example um, whereby um, you see the, the, well, the resistance movement is the, the title of this from a, from a Nature article. The, um, it started, um, this is from uh, an, enter, an enterobacterias that's resistant to carpapenem. Carpapenem um, is a drug that man, many of us, probably most of us in this room, have never actually used. It's a last resort 
antibiotic. It's an antibiotic that would currently be given if the other antibiotics don't work. And yet, this is a bacteria, uh, the enterobacteria, um, initially resistance was developed in India, where carpapenems are widely available because there's no physician prescription systems in India, given there aren't enough physicians, so that's understandable. But they're highly used in India, resistance developed in India, and traveled internationally. And it's not just, I don't just blame India, there is others that start in different places. Um, and so there is a global movement of these things. We know that, that this travels. And so here's a, a study just came out a couple months ago in The Lancet, which uh, it's, this is the same map that I showed at the beginning with the airlines, where I showed different cases of outbreaks of various things. Here is the, the same map, but this time these are outbreaks of resistant bacteria, specifically for that carpapenem, um, resistant to carpapenem, that last resort medicine. And so what you'll see is it, hap it tends to happen where there's, there's travel. Um, Halifax has an international airport. Uh, Halifax is uh, also at risk. So the superbugs are coming, the superbugs are coming, the sky is falling, um, but yet we aren't seeing the necessary level of action. And so in my own research, it's my, a lot of my work has been about, well, why aren't we seeing the necessary level of action? And what kind of action do we actually need to address this challenge? It's clear that Yes, we need more medical research. Yes, we need to understand the biology and the of viruses and bacteria. But there's something else here that requires additional efforts. And um, there's clearly some global governance and global market failures that are at play here, which is allowing this problem to, to spread so quickly and become such a challenge. And so just to, con to simplify, to, to convey this um, as easily as possible, the, um, I think of this problem as a three-part problem. So I think, so antimicrobial resistance, it's a challenge. And I think of it specifically as three, it's a three-pronged challenge. The first challenge is conservation. We need to conserve the effectiveness of our existing antimicrobials. It's too fast, our antimicrobials are becoming ineffective. That's a problem. The second thing we need to do is promote innovation. In 20 years, we have not come up with a new Anti -micro antibiotic. That's a problem. It means that we're dependent on old medicines that have, over the last decades, have become ineffective. Now, there's been some tweaks to some of these medicines which have made them more effective or different contexts, which is great. But uh, the lack of, there's been a, really a wholesale lack of innovation in this area, which is a problem. And then the third prong is access. Currently, more people die from a lack of access to antimicrobials than who die from um, antimicrobial resistance. Now that will likely change. By 2050, more people will die from resistance than from lack of access. But currently, there are millions of people, who, do in, mostly in the poorest countries in the world, who don't have access to antimicrobials. And as a result, uh, they die uh, or, or suffer um, all sorts of a range of consequences. And the challenge, though, is that it's, we can't just think of it as a pr three-pronged problem. We need to think of it as a three-pronged interlinking, inter interconnected problem. Because unfortunately, we can't actually address each of the prongs individually. We need to do so in concert. And the reason for that is that even if we provided, if we provided access to lots of antimicrobials, to people everywhere, whoever needed them, the problem is if we don't do it with conservation and we don't do it with innovation, then we just speed resistance. We actually just make our problem even worse. We also can't just focus on conserving existing antimicrobials because then we actually would be cons further constraining access, which means the millions of people who currently don't have would have even less access. And also it actually undermines innovation because by constraining access, we create a smaller market. And the, if there's fewer people who are gonna buy a medicine, for example, because we only allow it to be used for different contexts, then industry is far less incentivized to actually develop new products which they want to sell to many people for as high of a price as possible. And third, we can't just focus on innovation, which frankly has been our approach for the last uh, 70 years, uh, well, with the last two decades excluded, but that our approach used to be we would just invent a new drug, a new antibiotic. Uh, the problem is that innovation without access is just unjust, and innovation without conservation is wasteful, because what it means is we spend all this money inventing something new, and then a few years later, 
uh, resistance is, uh, to that drug is present. So what underlies global, inadequate global action? For me, it's two things. It's the global governance failure in that we have a classic collective action problem whereby every state would be incentivized in order for everyone to together address the problem. But each state is individually incentivized to deviate from enacting expensive policies because of various uh, challenges, which I'll discuss in a second. So it's a classic collective action problem. Think climate change. Climate change is an, an equivalent example where there's this global problem. We would all benefit if we all took action to address it. But we all are not taking the necessary level of action, partially because we're all depending on others to do so, and others deviate, and we deviate. We particularly don't look so great on climate change. Um, but uh, in terms of the global market for antibiotics, there's also failure there, in that we have the under-provision of this product in the poorest countries in the world. We have the over-provision of this product in all countries um, for people that were using these drugs when they're not uh, helpful. And third, there's insufficient innovation. So there's an innovation crisis um, in this particular area. And that's the market is not in set with current mechanisms uh, like patents. It's an insufficient incentive for industry to, to invest in innovation, which really points to the need uh, for this. If this is a public good challenge, we probably need public funding for it. To be more specific, there's some very um, concrete game theoretic problems that are at play here. So game theory is really all about uh, looking, at, uh, this, looking at strategy as to why actors behave in different ways uh, from an economic perspective. And so you can, you can, if one looks at the challenge, um, as I'll explain here, it's actually kind of rational that countries are not taking action at the moment. I say that, I think that's very unfortunate. But I would say the same thing for climate change. It's a bit rational and self-interested that, for example, Canada hasn't taken such great action on climate change. And for there's various reasons. And um, I, I would break it up, though, that there's different game theoretic problems for each of the three prongs that are part of this challenge. So let's start with innovation. In the case of innovation, why would a country like Canada want to spend lots of money on innovating for uh, new antibiotics if we can just wait for the United States to, put, to give that investment instead. And in fact, that's actually what we do. <laughs> we, uh, we free ride. It's a free rider problem. We free ride on the United States and Europe uh, in order to, we depend on them to develop drugs and then we, we use them, which, um, which is, yeah, we benefit <laughs> from that. Uh, but everyone does that. And uh, as a result, there's insufficient levels of innovation. The other challenge is that uh, how do you manage innovation. So it's, uh, these, these innovations are, are, are global common in that uh, we can't, it's very difficult to put restrictions on their use. Yes, there's patents. So legally, these, often these innovations are not, you can only use when the owner of the patent, for example, the pharmaceutical company, would sell it. But there's so much counterfeit medicine there's, uh, that it's a big, that it's a very difficult for even the owner of this intellectual property, of this innovation, to effectively manage it because of, uh, well, once a patent is put up online, uh, it can be reproduced and drugs can be remade. And so it's a, big, uh, it's a big challenge. In terms of conservation, we have the same, very similar problems. So um, in this case, uh, there's some unrealized positive externalities of investing in conservation efforts. So for example, um, with, uh, even if, uh, let's say, a, a country in Africa, uh, each country or at any country, each country would benefit from <coughs> conservation efforts themselves, but also they would benefit countries around them or any country where people travel to and from those countries would also benefit. So for example, if our hospitals are asked to take greater infection control um, prevention me measures, that's expensive. So we, we would be paying the cost, Canadian taxpayers or uh, Nova Scotia taxpayers would be paying the costs of improving infection prevention in uh, Nova Scotia hospitals. But New Brunswick would also benefit, and so would the United States, and so would anywhere uh, where people come from to visit Halifax and other uh, cities in this province. But yet, the total cost is borne by Nova Scotia. So that, what that means is that the full value of these, of these are not reflected by the people who would usually pay for them. And so there's a, there's a mismatch between 
means there's unrealized positive externalities that we're not achieving. There's coordination problems. Um, there's also, uh, again, global commons dilemmas. And then in terms of access, we have this challenge whereby, on one hand, we want to promote access to medicines around the world. We really, we, there is a global injustice happening and it's, there's a lot of attention on this. The challenge in terms of antimicrobial resistance is that when we, if we promote access in, a, in some ways, it could actually contribute to a negative externality, which is the development of resistance that can then spread internationally. So the need is not just for access, but actually appropriate <coughs> access, which costs more than just access. So, and as a result, what we see is here's a little bit of a mapping of the different actors globally who are responsible and doing work in different areas. Um, it's a bit of chaos. That's what this, this figure is really supposed to be. If, uh, <laughs> uh, instead of the actors, I could just write the word chaos. Uh, um, this issue has been known for a long time. For 40 years, the World Health Organization has been passing resolutions, drawing attention to it. So it's not that global action is, is, is absent. It's that it's both insufficient as well as not very well done. And so specifically, there's four key challenges. I call them uh, regime gaps. There's gaps in this global governance regime. Uh, one is coordination. Each actor sort of does their own thing. Two is compliance, in the sense that even countries, or even actors that say they're going to do something, the follow through is a different matter. <laughs> uh, third is leadership, in that there's really, at this point, no actor that's really carrying, um, carrying the flag to, make, to coordinate actors and really raise political priority. WHO has attempted, it's maybe not in the best uh, situation at the moment uh, to do so. And fourth is financing. Up until very recently, uh, there's been um, just a lack of money in this area. Uh, other priority, other health issues have gotten the priority. And so as a result, countries, including Canada, uh, haven't been taking the necessary level of action. So uh, even in Canada being one of the richest countries, therefore uh, we shouldn't be expecting um, the world's poorer countries to take action either. So this was a report from the Auditor General just uh, in May of 2014, uh, 2015, so not, a, not even a year ago, when the Auditor General reported that the Public Health Agency of Canada and other um, government agencies have not fulfilled key responsibilities to mitigate the public health risks posed by this challenge. It was, uh, the report was, um, if anyone here has ever read an Auditor General report, they're, um, they're usually pretty measured and uh, balanced, pros and cons. <laughs> Government always has an opportunity to comment and provide feedback along the way during an audit. This was pretty, pretty stark, uh, pretty dramatic, the, the language that was used. In no uncertain terms, the Auditor General let us know that our country is not doing what it needs to be doing. So um, if we're, I mean, we're one of the richest countries in the world, if we're not taking action, then, um, well, that explains why nearly every other country is also not taking the necessary level of action. So we're in this war, this battle of, uh, of our bodies where bacteria are uh, fighting and uh, we have this, on one hand we have bacteria that are causing us uh, uh, ill and harm and then our antibiotics, uh, well they're not doing so well in this, in this fight given uh, we haven't uh, replenished them but also we're abusing them. And so the question in my mind is then what do we need in order to address this challenge? Um, like what's the, what's the solution? I presented up until now all the problems but what uh, what can we actually do to solve this problem? And so for myself and uh, several colleagues, uh, we've come to the realization that because there's, such, there's action that's needed, it's needed to be global and interdependent, that maybe this issue, unlike many other issues, maybe this issue actually requires an international legal framework in order to address it. Maybe we need a treaty on antimicrobial resistance. And so we've, this was a, an editorial in the Bulletin of the World Health Organization where we called and tried to make a case for maybe of all the health issues out there, maybe this is the one that actually would benefit, really benefit the most from an international legal mechanism of some sort. And so why international law? Well, what we've argued is that there's some things about international law that only international law can do or that there are certain problems whereby international law is uniquely placed to try to address it. So, for example, this problem, the nature of the problem is that there's interdependence between countries. So in order to solve the problem, all countries need to act in order for any country to be safe. That seems like a good use of international law. The second is that there's interlocking actions needed. 
meaning that some countries might want to take action on some of those prongs. Uh, for example, some countries care more about access, and other countries would care more about innovation. But to solve the problem, we actually need to address all three. So what it means is because there's interlocking actions needed, and we actually need everyone to do all three, we need a mechanism that can commit, where states can commit to each other. That's international law. The third is that actions are costly, which means that no party is going to want to do it, their own actions, unless there's the strongest possible commitment from others that they're also going to do the same, and they're also going to incur the same costs. And so, well, our international system is relatively a weak system, um, but international law is the best we have in terms of it's the, the strongest way states can make commitments to each other. I know it's not perfect. There's lots of people who discuss in good ways why, whether international law has any effect at all. I'm an international lawyer. I do believe international law is important. But in this case, even if it's not 100% effective, it's the most effective thing we currently have. So. And the fourth is that international laws are really long-term instruments. And uh, in this case, because our short-term incentives to deviate from collective action are contrary to our long-term incentive, which is to cooperate, it means we need a lock-in mechanism. International treaties provide that. We can lock in countries and then actually, through a treaty, disincentivize deviation. And so what we really need, superbugs, to win this war on superbugs, we need an institutionalized grand bargain. What could that grand bargain, what, what's needed as part of that grand bargain? Well, there's at least two sets of things that are needed. We need content of an international treaty. So we need what are those policies or those regulations that every state is going to agree to do. And so, as I've mentioned, we need to think about access, conservation, and innovation. We need policies for all three. Every state has to commit to doing stuff in those areas. But just committing is not enough. And that's the problem that people often talk about with international treaties. Lots of talk, no action. And so one of the key things that we need to make sure is that that doesn't happen with this. And so one way to do so is to build in strong implementation mechanisms, whereby we build institutions that encourage, um, that uh, rally countries together and help make it easier for countries in order to comply. We have incentives, either positive or so carrots or sticks, to ensure that countries stick to their promises. And third, interest mobilizers, so advocacy um, and lobbying related efforts supporting that. And so myself and colleagues have started to do work about what would, what would the content of an international treaty look like on this issue. Here's a picture of an article that was published um, three months ago in the, in the Lancet uh, Medical Journal that really starts to lay out where are the key areas where we need, we need international cooperation. And then um, in terms of implementation mechanisms, more recently, <coughs> just a few weeks ago, the Bulletin of the World Health Organization published this study of mine, um, which we, we suss out what are some of these implementation mechanisms. So how do we build institutions? And so um, in terms of, first of all, content and then institutions, in terms of content, what we've been saying is that we need, on conservation, there's about seven policies that all countries need to commit to doing. So one is that is the prohibiting the use of antimicrobials for growth promotion or routine prevention in animals. That was that we need countries to ban industry, to ban farmers from using it for low value purposes. If animals are sick, of course, they need to be treated. But simply to use antimicrobials as a way of reducing food prices so that we, that we don't have to feed animals as much, that's, uh, that should be illegal under international law, we, we think. The second would be regulating antimicrobial prescription and availability for humans. So right now in Canada, we already have this. So if we need an antibiotic, we have to go to our doctor and we have to get a prescription and then we go to the pharmacy and it gets filled. In many countries where there aren't enough doctors and aren't enough pharmacists and other health professionals, antimicrobials are available much more broadly, sort of at the corner store. Now, um, to demand a doctor's note for a prescription would mean the death of many people and effect of Ill, illness for many people in many poor countries. So we need some way, it's not necessarily prescription, but we need some way of regulating the use. And third, at the very least, we need to regulate the use of certain types of antibiotics. The new last resort medicines, those really need to be make sure that we, we only use them when needed. And that includes never using those in animals. Fourth, we need to improve surveillance. Fifth, we need to promote education on the effective use so that 
so that people, uh, the 65 percent of people, aren't demanding uh, or aren't pressuring doctors um, to get an antibiotic after they when they have a sore throat. Uh, we need to strengthen infection control practices, uh, and then we need to prohibit marketing. So in Canada, we don't have direct to consumer marketing of our drugs, but in many countries, pharmaceutical companies are actively have they've billboards and posters promoting people if you're sick, take get this antibiotic. And uh, in a country where there's a doctor, the doctor can be um, a bit of a, uh, a door in terms of stopping, like, yeah, you see that, that marketing, but it's not needed for you. But what about in a country that, where you can get an antibiotic on the street uh, or in a corner store? Uh, if you see the ad, you might just go get it. So that should be illegal, as it already is in Canada. And then we need content on access and innovation. I see I'm running out of time, so I'll speed up. But um, in terms of uh, innovation, we need public funding and incentives <laughs> for private and public innovation. Uh, this, um, unfortunately, um, this, this problem with our current market structures, the way patents work, the way pharmaceuticals are regulated, there is insufficient private incentive to develop new drugs. And why would a company develop a drug that a government is then going to restrict its use on, only allow you to, s to sell it to very few people, put caps on costs? And if I, I would not be investing in a pharmaceutical company that only develops antibiotics uh, at the moment. But if there was public money that went to it to create a public good that was then properly conserved, then uh, we could finally see innovation. And hopefully any public dollars are linked to access provisions to make sure that all people get access. We need to mobilize financial resources for infrastructure. So poor countries in the world realistically are going to need support from wealthier countries to develop surveillance systems so that we can track viruses and bacteria as they spread. And we need funding for access. I think this is a key in that we need to make sure that poor countries are not just instituting measures that will be helping out, expensive measures that will help um, conserve existing antimicrobials when they then don't have access to those very same antimicrobials in many contexts. So there needs to be a bit of a balance there. In terms of implementation, there's many things we can do to promote, to make sure that the value of the treaty is not just uh, the ink on the, on the paper on which it's written or the, the keyboard on which it's typed. Uh, but actually it has an impact. So we can establish monitored milestones. We can have a code of practice. We can have an interagency task force coordinating UN actors. Uh, or we can create an intergovernmental panel, like we see in climate change, where there's different scientific working groups and regular reporting. We can have incentives so we can link uh, compliance with this treaty with fun access to funding. We can create a global pooled fund in order to uh, finance uh, efforts towards being compliant. Uh, we can condition benefits and support. And then in terms of mobilizing interest, we can um, task special representatives to rally the troops. We can have a high-level panel to bring uh, political attention to the issue. And we can develop multi-stakeholder partnerships that try to bring states and non-state actors and industry all together to try to solve this challenge. So to conclude, it's clear that we cannot just tackle the biological and clinical manifestation of this challenge. We need to do that, too. <laughs> we need more research on biology. We need better clinical practice. But we also need to tackle this difficult global political economy of inaction. And in my mind, and for many people and a growing number of people around the world, we're starting to think that an international treaty could provide legal protection against this challenge. Uh, that currently is risking all of our well-being uh, now and in the future. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much, Stephen. So we have plenty of time for questions, comments, discussion. I hope I didn't scare everyone. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. So um, what role does vaccination play um, in terms of addressing this challenge? The, uh, an infection that's prevented is one that doesn't later need to be treated. So it's reducing the demand and need for the use of antimicrobials. Uh, so, and it's not just humans, it's also uh, in animals. Um, so in Norway, for example, all fish need to be vaccinated. It's a thing. <laughs> uh, yes, Norwegian uh, salmon, if anyone enjoys that. Uh, it's vaccinated, which is good. Um, the, 
the challenge um, is that uh, we can actually do quite a bit. Um, that when we see that antimicrobial resistance is a natural process, we, we need antimicrobials are going to be used, we want them to be used when they're going to be effective. And so if we can just lower the number of times when we actually need to use them, uh, hopefully uh, we'll then use them less and then we'll have less resistance. That's right. Yeah. So there's debates about whether we should be using those at all. <laughs> uh, I'm not. So I'm not a physician. Uh, I, I think my understanding is that there's a bit of nuance. Some of the products are um, are maybe higher value use. Others are really not. Um, yeah, I, um, there is, I, I know there's nuance in, in that, but it is an interesting development how the la I think it's more the labeling that's being used by companies to sell product. It's the same way I mentioned in my talk, I talked about the antibiotic um, formula for paint. Uh, I'm not sure how effective that would be, the paint, um, but may maybe, it, yeah, it's, I think we need to put a, the big question we have to ask is what are high value uses of antimicrobials? And then how do we ensure we are only using these products for high value uses? Yeah, the tobacco example of spraying tobacco fields with antimicrobials, that's, uh, that's the best example of a low value use, which should clearly be illegal. Yeah. So, yeah. On the human side, I'm surprised you haven't spoken about the role of patients. Mm. I think you've overestimated, even a sophisticated like you have overestimated the value of penicillin for sore throats. And the interests of patients and your interests are aligned when people don't take drugs that are useless or harmful. So why don't we have a regulatory framework where there's an insistence that the drug packaging include information about numbers needed to treat and numbers needed to harm? And I, I imagine even in this group, where probably everybody has taken a drug. Very few people have asked when they received the drug, how many people are helped, how many are helped. In your example, which is a specific example of a general problem of overprescribing in Canada, a labeling requirement saying you have a one in a hundred chance that this will help you, most people would ask more about, am I the one who's likely to be helped or not? And yeah. you, may, you may not even need a large framework to do it, just a simple comment. The way we have nutritional contents of foods have something about the drugs that we give to people. Yeah, so you asked about the role of patients and uh, the role of uh, labeling um, uh, medicines uh, and the risks or the potential effectiveness, uh, uh, how helpful that might be. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know how many people um, how many, I don't know how many people read the existing labels on medicines. Um, I don't. Well, they're not useful. Yeah. They say this drug may kill you, yeah. or so, this drug may help you. Yeah. And yeah. the real question is, if a thousand people take it, how many are killed? How many are helped? Yeah, yeah. And the labels, there's no point in reading them, because they don't provide the information that you really need, which is a quantitative one. Yeah. When a patient's taking a drug, they're making a wager that the benefits are more likely to outweigh the harm. That's right. Yeah, so I guess you have a lot of faith in a uh, patient's ability to understand those kind of statistics. I think if you had a simple thing, if 100 people take this drug, one will benefit, 99 will, 10 yeah. will be harmed. I have faith that most people will understand. Yeah. At least the people in this room, and they would tell their friends who may be less sophisticated. <laughs> yeah, I mean, even if, uh, so, so let me, so you, you've said that we, if people are given the information, maybe they would act um, better in this. Um, but uh, from, a, from a self interested, even if that was the case, I don't, I'm not sure I agree, but even if it was the case, um, from a self interested perspective, people are still maybe incentivized to take an antibiotic if there is a one in a hundred chance. It's usually more like, uh, let's say, a ten in, a one in ten chance. But four in a hundred chance that you get diarrhea, that's right, because the consequences, adverse events. So you have yeah. to have the harm from the benefit. Mm. Yeah, but I, uh, yeah, no, I'm, uh, I'm not, a, I'm not, I'm not convinced. And also the, um, the self-interest, because remember the consequences of us taking an, an antibiotic uh, when it's not needed are not fully borne by us. The greater cost is to the population. It's to everyone else. So we are personally a bit 
self, it's, a, it's rational for us to consume it even if there's, let's say, a 10% chance of it working because the risks are borne by everyone, not just us. I should sure, probably continue. Just ask that we keep moving. Yeah. 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 Just to that matter of like, the issue of the idea of like, the issue with that type thing also is that public literacy and people that have access to, to actually understanding those type of things, even if you label the bottle, the chance that someone will understand what that bottle was saying, uh, you know, most people don't have access to being able to understand that type of stuff. I'm sure your doctor could explain to you, but sometimes, you know, they're speaking another language to the average person. So people like us who actually uh, take an interest in these type of things, it, it's more understandable. So I think what um, the gentleman is saying is that although we may label things, you know, some people don't pay attention to those labels and they'll still power feel. You know, just like if you go into the supermarket and you read a label of a food box, mo most likely if you don't have access to anything better, you're going to pick up that food box and buy it anyway. There's a, there's a hand uh, in the back. Oh, if I can. Jump in right after that. Great, perfect. Yep. Um, well, personally speaking, I take um, powdered Chinese herbs when I'm sick, and I find them very effective. And I haven't taken antibiotics for about 25 years. And I also eat organic food and don't use any soap that we were speaking about. And so I'm just wondering if people in that kind of subset, if they were to become ill and needed antibiotics, would they be more, um, would it be more workable for them? Unfortunately, uh, no, because uh, if the infection that uh, someone who, so the question was whether someone who doesn't take antibiotics um, and uses alternative methods or and eats organic food and doesn't use uh, this antibiotic soaps and isn't exposed to antibiotics, whether when they do have antibiotics, would, it, um, would they be effective? Uh, it depends on the infection. If the infection is caused by, let's say, a, a bacteria that has resistance, to drugs, then yeah. yeah. Matter, just the That's right. But uh, you mentioned organic uh, food. So uh, since I've done work, since I started doing work in this area, I, um, I've, I personally now only eat um, antibiotic-free meat. Mm -hmm. It's uh, not for my own personal health because um, the, the, during the last 90 days of an animal's life, uh, farmers are already not feeding them antimicrobials to wash it out of the system such that the actual meat that I eat, the antibiotic-free meat, it, or, or the regular meat, it, it, none of it has antibiotics in it, or none of it should, from, uh, legally. Um, but by me, I, I decide that uh, there's um, an opportunity to reduce the market demand for farmers to do a practice, which I'm hoping they won't do. Uh, I think the real, uh, we really need regulation. We need bans on the use of uh, low value, uh, the low value use of antimicrobials in animals. Um, but, uh, so I, I, I follow that practice from a population health perspective. There was someone here, yeah. Yes, so thank you very much for this very important presentation because uh, uh, there's another side of antimicrobial resistance and we, we usually focus on the human side. Mm -hmm. um, so thank you for that. Uh, so education, I really see as a key piece in the strategy yeah. in educating people. Uh, and to back to one of the questions uh, about patients or people knowing about it and reading the labels, usually when prescriptions are given, by the time they get their prescription, that's the time when they actually come to know about the, the medication and its use and side effects and all of that. So a step back even before they're prescribed is where the education yeah. needs to happen. Um, my question really was about uh, about the access piece in the third world countries. Uh, could you expand a little bit more on how that will help balance the equation? Yeah. So, um, for example, uh, one. Um, so the question was uh, about the role of ac uh, access or lack of access to antimicrobials in developing countries. So one. Um, so two hundred thousand uh, neonates die each year because of lack of access to injectable antibiotics. Um, uh, lots of people um, die from a range of so diseases that we, um, uh, from pneumonias and other things that uh, really um, we can mostly prevent already if they had the same, those same diseases, uh, infections in Canada. So the need for access is in, in right now an enormous global justice imperative. 
uh, and the lack of access is a global injustice at the moment. The challenge will be going forward that uh, efforts to promote access to medicines, which I strongly support and we need to do, they, they need to do it in a way that's pairing access to antimicrobials with their conservation at the same time. It's a, what we need is not access to medicines, we need appropriate access to medicines. And so doing that is unfortunately more expensive than simply promoting access to medicines. So already groups like, there's, a, there's a, an agency called the Global Fund uh, to fight um, AIDS, TB, tuberculosis, and malaria. Uh, that agency, that funding, that is a global pooled fund, they already take action on this and that uh, they fund diagnostics for things to make sure that the medicines that it pays for in the poorest countries uh, are hopefully being used as appropriately as current technology allows. There's also increasing um, emphasis on developing diagnostics that can actually detect, okay, this person has this infection, which to which antibiotics is it susceptible? So which one of the, let's say, six different kinds, which one will work on this particular patient's case? Now, in uh, mostly diagnostics, we think of it's a lab. So you take a blood sample or a swab, you send it to a lab, you get the results the, day, the next day, and your doctor might give you a call saying, yeah, take antibiotics or don't take them. Uh, in uh, most developing countries, uh, so labs, not very many, um, the 24-hour delay is a problem because will people, will they be able, the doctor, if there is a doctor, be able to reach their patient? Uh, and then if they, the doctor says, yes, let's take your medicine, can the person afford to buy the medicine that they need, rather than the cheaper one that the pharmaceutical company is advertising to, and promises that will work whenever they're sick for anything. So uh, there's lots of challenges. Sometimes in the interim that they get the results back, they put the person on an antibiotic anyway, and then they switch over to another issue also. Probably. Yeah, so I'm not, uh, so in terms of uh, putting someone uh, on an antibiotic before knowing for sure if it's susceptible. Um, so I'm, yeah, I'm not a physician. I'm sure under many circumstances that's appropriate and maybe under, also under circumstances it's inappropriate. I don't, um, I don't know, but uh, uh, Janice? Certainly, uh, you know, as somebody who's worked in, in, in low-income countries and in the continent of Africa and clo quite closely with the WHO in the last seven or eight years, Appropriate has been taken up by all sorts of gamers, mm -hmm. okay, and, 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 and it, it's almost become a gloss for the lowest cost, and the lowest cost ends up being something that is gained into an agro-business, a, 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 a big pharma a advantage. I'm working on a paper right now that, that shows that with an energetic stack scene. And, and, and it's really um, a problem, and I mean, I see, you know, I, I just checked out your, your, your bulletins, and, and it's all very fine and well to talk about governance of this, but I mean, even in Canada, we know these policies are, I mean, you could sit down and write them, draft them now, and whether it's a liberal government or a conservative government, the chance of getting them through, and then it, until there is a, the, the major, the major uh, international and, and you know, pandemic type of event, it's not going to happen. We saw the whole of the So I'm wondering, you know, where do you think this is going to go? I am a bit more hopeful. So you've asked, uh, what's the, maybe you've asked like, the political feasibility of actually getting traction on this issue in the short term. I, um, so yeah, it's a bit depressing. <laughs> My talk is mostly <laughs> depressing. Um, but I am, I should have ended, in fact, next time I give a talk like this, I'm going to end on a positive note, which I think we do, there is something that's happening. Two, over the last couple of years, not la last 18 months, we've seen a lot of countries start to say, we want to take action on this. On the last G7 meeting in the communique, they talked about antimicrobial resistance as a great security threat that needs to be addressed. Uh, billions of dollars uh, have gone into this, new billions of dollars, uh, I guess a, a couple billion dollars. But that's still uh, the right number of zeros in terms of solve, uh, addressing this challenge. Um, this September, there's uh, going to be debate of a UN General Assembly resolution. Basically, that's uh, acknowledging that it's not just Geneva and the technical people that uh, have a role to play in this. It's also the diplomats and the foreign policy people in New York that uh, have a role to play. In terms of in Canada, um, for a decade, we had a federal government that did not believe in federal leadership on health issues. So most health dollars in Canada would be spent appropriately so at the provincial level, given hospitals and physician services um, and drugs are mostly coming it's under provincial jurisdiction, given our constitution. 
And so mo there's fewer federal functions in that area of health. And for a decade, we had a government that didn't believe in federal leadership. But unfortunately, on antimicrobial resistance, it's a challenge that provinces can't actually address on their own. Yes, they can do the clinical part of it. So promoting hospital infection prevention practices, trying to reduce the physician prescription of antibiotics, provinces can do. Provinces could not regulate the same way that the federal government could on animals, um, on the use of animals, on the surveillance uh, of tracking resistance, diagnostics. So uh, now we have an, a new federal government that has shown through discussions around the health accord, for example, that they are not only willing, but actually they want to take a federal leadership role in, on, on health issues. Antimicrobial resistance would be a natural one whereby it is one of the only health challenges that we can only address in Canada if the federal government takes leadership because the provinces can't do it on their own. So there's such a business case. There's a polit there is political momentum for the federal government to do something. There's that Auditor General's report that was so damning. The Maybe. The business case, both in the Africa and the World Health Organization and with our federal government, I would argue the liberal government before the conservative mm -hmm. government let, let us down this neglect of health care in this country. So e e each kind of succeed the other mm -hmm. um, is that, that you're not going to, you, we need to, the governance issues to follow the money, the billions of dollars, because those billions of dollars are already identified and being earmarked by a few of the groups that are actually causing this problem. That's right. Yeah, so and hopefully Canada can increasingly um, contribute to those, that, that, that amount of uh, funding. It's, um, it hasn't been a priority to date. <laughs> it's my politically uh, correct way of <laughs> describing it. Yeah. You've talked about um, funding and sort of where the money is coming from briefly, but I'm just wondering yeah, if you can talk a little bit more about that because there's the other side of access that I'm concerned about, not just having access to um, to microbials, but um, what about, you know, when you take away antibiotics, the food gets more expensive. Eating mm. organic, for example, is a very expensive activity. Yep. Yep. And on one hand, this is talking about stopping a problem, you know, that we're going to have very soon. On the other hand, I still see this huge problem at the other end of, you know, yes, I definitely wish we could better and stuff like that, but the moment you raise prices of even vegetables because they get sick more often because they don't have those antibiotics. You know, we're, we're, what are we going to do with that side of, of the problem? Yeah, so it's a great question about what happens uh, when we start taking action on antimicrobial resistance, such as to limit the use of antimicrobials. What happens then um, for other things like the cost of food? And the, um, so the answer is uh, those are exactly the questions we need to be thinking about as well. But um, I don't think it's as severe as, um, I don't think those consequences are as severe as, um, as maybe you might be worried about. Um, for example, um, currently antibiotics, when we get an antibiotic, we, they're quite expensive, or they can be quite expensive when we go to a pharmacy and order them. Farmers, on the other hand, can buy antibiotics online in big bulk bags by the kilogram. They sell it by the kilogram. We get little tiny pills for us, it's available online in industrial grade, not for human consumption, but it's industrial grade in kilograms. And so uh, economists have started to try to address these questions and um, they think that uh, if we impose a tax levy on the sale of antimicrobials, just $10 per kilogram, so for a big bag, just put a $10 fee on it, suddenly, mo in at least North America, and then for sure actually the rest of the world, most of the lowest value use of antimicrobials in animals would suddenly become no longer cost effective. It becomes cheaper to use alternatives in order to achieve the same goals. So, uh, I mean, $10 per kilogram is still $10 per kilogram. But uh, the, the, what we need to do is somehow increase the cost, whether it's through regulation or through a Pigovian tax, which would then allow um, to discourage this kind of use, whether because law prohibits it or because it's not economically viable. Yeah, and one doesn't need to eat organic food. Um, uh, so my, 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 the code I use, I, I look for antibiotic free. Some organic food is antibiotic free, but a lot of other food is not. And for me, I focus on land animals, which is where there's the greatest, human, uh, the greatest risk to humans. Yeah, fish is much more complicated. <laughs> there's a, right over here, in the front. I'm curious mm -hmm. as to whether, um, having things that have active bacteria, such as yogurt, would help the situation in terms of 
um, plus resistant bacteria or in humans as to not getting bacterial infections to begin with, or would it make it worse? Mm. I'm, um, I'm, not, uh, I'm not a physician, I wouldn't, uh, that's, um, the question was whether um, the consumption of um, live bacteria such as in yogurt um, uh, would maybe provide some protective effect. Um, I mean, to the, so I'm not a physician, I don't, I don't know the exact answer, but to the extent that we can prevent infection from happening, it then reduces the need to actually use these kind of products. So I'm, I don't know what this, I don't know the science of, um, of like probiotic, I think is what, yeah. I don't know the science on probiotic, but um, if, it, if it works, then uh, that would be great. That would, <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. I, I love the concept of the international treaty, which is all these problems. So in theory, I like that concept. In practice, I'm a little bit cynical about international treaties, and you might know more about them than me in terms of your international order, but I've been involved in a couple of treaties where we had to sign them and whatever, and they get ratified by provinces. They were on topics in which the responsibilities for healthcare, for example, are totally provincial. So how do you get a federal treaty to be ratified by the provinces? And how do you then, then the way we deliver health services, like government doesn't even deliver them. Like there's different bodies, like physicians are independent, the health funds are independent. Like how is that going to work in a country like Canada? Like I know that it gives a global profile and it's a good thing to do, sounds good in theory, but in practice, like if you kind of thought through all of those complications that we have to go through and the hoops that we have to jump through to get that treaty actually working on the ground. Yeah, so it's a, the question, uh, the challenge of implementing international treaties in countries with federal structures. Um, so that's a challenge. That's a challenge for all uh, treaties for countries with federal structures. And it's not just uh, Canada that has a federation. Uh, the United States has 50 states, and uh, many countries use federal models, um, for which it's always a challenge. The international legal obligation rests on the national, rests on the state as a whole, and that state has a legal obligation to work with its provinces um, or sub-jurisdictions to make sure that it's in compliance. Uh, we have some success, we have a lot of success. I mean, our federal government's often talking to our provincial governments on, on these issues, human rights, for example. Um, in the health world, there's the international health regulations, which governs how we respond to pandemics. When it was revised in 2005, and when the Public Health Agency of Canada was created, there's a lot of impetus to get coordinated across the country. Uh, because what happened during SARS, in, specifically in Toronto in 2003, whereby there was not communication between the Toronto health authorities with the provincial health authorities and then up to the federal government. What it meant is that Canada was not able to report, the federal government, which had the legal obligation, was not able to report uh, to WHO, the World Health Organization, what the state of affairs was in Toronto. As a result, the World Health Organization slapped a travel advisory against Toronto. No information meant they took the precautionary principle. So. Um, Canada was in highly incentivized to change, and so that I don't think would happen today in the same way. Yeah, so that's collaborative. <laughs> yeah, maybe that's 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 maybe part of it. I know I think I've neglected this side of the uh, the room because of the way I. Is there any any questions here? Were there? No. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Great. Come back. Um, my question. Um, it's kind of a piggybacking on the, the issue of the other side. Um, uh, I was wondering if it's possible to kind of implement uh, policies that could prevent uh, prices being uh, so high in terms of having access to a, a healthier lifestyle so that you won't have to use so many uh, antimicrobials. So in this type of uh, intervention, can you possibly produce those type of policies? Yes, yeah, so the question is whether we can focus more attention on preventing disease in the first place, staying healthy, so then avoid the need for more antimicrobial use. Um, so yeah, I think, I mean, health, health promotion, public health, um, these are areas of our health care system which are grossly underfunded. Uh, there's been attempts to try to provide more funding to public health, for example, and health promotion. Um, it's really hard when there's patients who have particular diseases and need access to particular drugs, which already aren't covered in most provinces. And uh, it's really, it's politically extremely difficult. You have a face of, it's really, it's the difference between a real life that's there and that can get a, a photo in the front page of a newspaper versus a statistical life, which um, 
we don't know when we benefit. We've all benefited from public health. Most people in this room are living, um, are living longer than the average age of people who lived uh, several hundred years ago. So we're all, most of us are here because of public health, but uh, we don't think of it like that and we don't invest accordingly. So um, I'm all in favor of doing exactly what you've described. Um, the challenge will be is that there, it's a bit distal in that there, there is this live problem and t if we did that, which I hope we do, but there's this very pressing problem which we also need to address and um, I guess there's, and there are things we can do about it in a more proximal way. Yeah. Great, over here. Yeah. Oh, you're, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. So we can take uh, one final question and oh. then we're, I'm afraid, out of our time, so. Do you want to let you choose uh, who gets the final? Uh, no, it's yeah. mine? Oh, okay, <laughs> yes, sir, okay. Um, what did the pharmaceutical companies think of you? Yeah, so um, it's uh, mixed in a sense. So uh, at the World Economic Forum last week, there was 80 pharmaceutical companies, the biggest ones plus others, um, came together, uh, the CEOs, with a statement saying that they would like to see additional public funding for them to do innovation. So, <laughs> surprise! <laughs> Uh, no, and we shouldn't be so surprised that uh, industry wants more funding to do innovation. But um, what was also good about it is that they acknowledged that there is a need for alternative market models, that they know that with public funding comes some other things, like a commitment to ensuring access. Or, for example, maybe even not using existing intellectual property regimes. So maybe they just help develop it, and then anyone around the world can, can create it, but for a fee. I mean, they need, they need to be incentivized, but they're, so they, they um, expressed great interest in exploring alternative economic models. Yeah. So you're saying uh, pharmaceutical companies have a poor record of social responsibility? Yeah. They, uh, well, they, some, some are better than others. Uh, but uh, I mean, so pharmaceutical companies, they're, they're not in favor of everything. So um, for, I mean, conservation uh, efforts would uh, restrict the size of their markets to sell the existing drugs that they make. So they don't like that. <laughs> they don't like bans on advertising. <laughs> thing a couple of years ago on NIH dealing with NDM and stuff like mm. that, and it was quite shocking to them that when they went to the pharmaceuticals, they said, why would we develop a drug yeah. that somebody is going to use once? We're more interested in long-term. Yeah, that's why pharmaceutical companies uh, would prefer to develop a treatment rather than a cure. Mm. Yeah. Great, so uh, thank you so much. Please join me in thanking. Oh. Yeah.